Johannes, maybe if I can start with you to comment actually on what Gerard said there. And, and so right, I think we can all look at what's been happening on the construction side and we're probably still using the same methods and maybe uh, getting the same results, but uh, the possibilities are without a doubt endless. So in terms of the structure of buildings and how things are looking, what do you say? It's totally, I totally agree with it. It's like um, we still build brick on brick, basically, and just very little companies um, do modular or flexible buildings, and that's a prerequisite for sustainable building, because. Uh, in our experience, the HVAC system and technical system is changing tremendously over time, especially um, you see the rapid, de uh, the rapid um, develop, um, developments in the t HVAC systems. Um, it's everything new and um, so far we, we think it's about every 20 years you have to build a totally new HVAC system and the, our buildings are not built like that. So in order to, to have this kind of fast adaption of technologies, you have to have also like a structure that supports this uh, this developments and this technical technological uptake and modular buildings or flexibility in this kind of sense really kicks off then and um, regarding the lifetime it also would matter if you um, you can also build a building if it's like uh, like Norman Foster did um, if it's supposed to be like for a short lifetime like then for 50 or 100 years um, you can take into account this kind of what do you do with the materials at the end of life? Do you recycle? What do you do? Do you reuse? Do you disassemble and build somewhere else? Um, but it's just possible with new manufacturing techniques. Um, we'll come back more and talk actually about that, the concept of the life cycle to assessments in terms of what we need to do. But Stuart, you look at buildings you know, all around. And again, I think one of the things we hear here and we've heard throughout this week and when we think about it this week is about sustainability. So when we do look at buildings, sustainability very much, I think, also is about efficiency of buildings. And, I mean, how energy efficient are the majority of buildings? How, how, would, you rate, how would you rate this all? Well, big, uh, big exhibition boxes are actually fairly easy to make energy efficient because uh, there's no real desire to look outside from them. Um, so within this hall, the walls on the back, it's very easy to make them very energy efficient. We can have a thick, very thermally efficient envelope on them. Um, the, the big challenge is, uh, is trying to, to overcome sort of the perception that to have a quality building out there you need to be able to see everything from every point within the building um, and that's driven by uh, a number of different factors but predominantly uh, you know, leasing agents and, uh, and uh, sort of people within the building industry that, uh, that are trying to sell a certain image as opposed to understanding the, the full uh, <coughs> design of a building and, and the full life cycle energy use of a building. And, I mean, does that still work? Style still sells, does it? Even though it might be the most inefficient building in the place. <laughs> well, you know, on every building project we try to uh, push the, the sustainability agenda. You know, we work with top architects like Foster and Partners who also have a similar uh, emphasis in their design. Um, but the number of conversations you have with even uh, uh, more experienced uh, building developers, uh, you're, you still find that you need to provide an education uh, into what should be the way forward and what they could be doing uh, and not just doing the same status quo that they've been doing for many years. Now, Hadi, you talk a lot about the, the multi-comfort approach. And again, when we look at design and we look at putting a building together, it's not just about putting a foundation in place and putting four walls there. We're really looking at you know, how it looks, acoustic, all of that. So give me a feel in terms of how important it is, maybe that holistic approach that, you know, all of you at San Coban would be looking at. Well, uh, as a supplier of building materials and construction materials, San Coban has put a strategy around multi-comfort. Uh, multi-comfort is a concept uh, that is around creating living spaces that are comfortable and uh, nice to live in. Uh, Gerard mentioned connecting with nature. So it's in fact talking to our senses, our visual comfort, acoustic comfort, thermal, humidity, but also aspects relating to air quality and relating to safety. So all of this is really at the center of the strategy that is inspiring most of our businesses. Saint-Gobain is known for glass, of course, historically since 300 
and 50 years, but we are also <coughs> involved in other materials, mainly external insulation systems, uh, drywall systems, uh, and a number of solutions which uh, we will have the chance to showcase in Masdar City in a multi-comfort house we plan to build uh, uh, very soon. Okay, well, one to watch here and one we can all probably visit. I was actually out there <coughs> recently and also they talked about the eco-friendly villa that they put in place. So, And also, if any of you are around tomorrow, there's a, a community festival at Mazdar for the next two days. So it's an opportunity to actually go there, walk around the building and to really have a look and see what's going on and experience it. And I love going out there, Gerard. Um, but also, I'm absolutely amazed when you showed us the difference in just the temperature alone, that how creating that space and not as much space between the buildings and all of that, that you can actually make it they, what they've always wanted to do, a more sustainable and a more livable city. How important is that, and particularly in this region? Well, I think, it's, I think that's very important, but I think it's also very important to note that that doesn't cost you any money. That actually, good design and design of the urban environment, placing one building against another, making sure the spaces within the between buildings are right, um, that's what actually gives you the urban environment in Mazda. That's what's producing those lower temperatures in the streets, is the fact that one building next to another is in the right location that gives you shading in, and the height and, and position is, 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 is right. And I think that's, uh, that's a very important first step. I think the second step that we need to take is that, you know, we talked about scale, I talked about the economics of scale. And um, it really is an issue because if the, if the scale is right, the, the reason that the car and the reason that the uh, transportation uh, side of life has increased and developed is so well is because they're dealing with scale and bigger scale and actually we've got to move to a bigger scale of construction. Okay, I can see how you can do that perhaps in this area, but you're constrained in many urban areas whereby there, there's just not space. So what do you do? You, you build up? You build? Well, I think, or I you think, just move out? I think what you have to do is you have to, uh, you have to create systems which will provide a variety of, of architectural responses. So it's how do you how do you create new systems and how do those systems then produce different versions? Just as, you know, on an annual basis, car, the car industry produces new models. Uh, we can do exactly the same in the building industry, in the <coughs> architecture of the building industry, um, if we create the right systems and the right frameworks. The problem is that developers are not interested in those, particularly interested in those frameworks at the moment because people understand how their profits are built up. And uh, so to change an industry, you have to change how profits are built up. And uh, that's a big shift for the mm. industry. And a very different panel discussion, I would imagine, too. <laughs> yeah. Stuart, come in on yeah. this. And uh, in terms of picking what Gerard has said there about the, you know, the space between the buildings and the ventilation and the movement of air and, and yeah. people and all of that, how important is that? I, I think, you know, the, the, the radiant comfort that Gerard was I like that, the radiant on. comfort. I mean, it's, it's my buzzword and, for the day. And the term mean radiant temperature. It has yes. a bunch of different, you know, your own personal comfort as a human, it's impacted by the air temperature, it's impacted by the humidity, it's impacted by the speed of which air is moving over your body so that your body can self-cool. It's implemented by the clothing you wear, um, as well as the surface temperatures and what's being radiated back to you. And if you can affect all of those factors, uh, to the best of your ability in a master plan when you're designing where the buildings are going and how wide the streets are and how you encourage air circulation in the right way. Um, you can create spaces that are more comfortable for more of the time, uh, especially in an environment like this where for, for a lot of the year um, <coughs> we could be comfortable sitting outside. Um, and it isn't utilized all the time. And I, But going back to the idea of the industry sort of the, the car industry being able to have the sense of scale that they're able to invest in new processes. Um, within the building industry, the facade industry is one that I think has taken a lead on that uh, because it is moving more and more into factory production and less and less has been done on site. And, and they have the scale already where they're selling a product which they have different models of, to use the car analogy, which they can place on multiple buildings, they can sell in multiple parts of the world. 
um, and they've been able to invest in, in production of that nature. We need to get the rest of the building industry, the structural <coughs> aspects, the, 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 the HVAC, the mechanical engineering, to, to do similar things so that we can get a more holistic uh, sense of scale the way the building envelope and the car industry can do. Hadi, talk to me a little bit about the, the passive solutions that are in place. You talked about, obviously, the fabrics that are in the buildings and how important that is. I mean, in many times when you look at buildings, and yes, and even in some uh, buildings in this area, you know, pe people are getting very fed up that perhaps the quality is not as good as it should be and the soundproofing is not as good. And again, it comes down to where people want to live and how good the quality of life is when they go into these buildings. But again, how important is that? And particularly here, when we look at, you know, the harsh extremes of weather, I mean, now it's absolutely beautiful here. But, uh, you know, come back in the middle of July, it's a very different story. Uh, in fact, we have a number of solutions, passive solutions, that are aimed at reducing the energy bill. One of them is the external thermal insulation composite system, ETIX. And this can be used for new buildings, but also for retrofit, because, uh, I mean, new construction, new modes of construction, uh, the examples that Gerard gave are the future, but we should not forget that the established number of buildings is going to stay here for another 30, 40 years and then energy consumption uh, cannot change unless we retrofit them or we, we create a certain envelope that would reduce this full energy bills. And we have done studies in this respect where we have reached more than 50% reduction on the energy. And this falls into the sustainability cycle. Another thing that we're trying to do here, it's inspired from cold countries, it's the air well, uh, something, a system we call Elixir, where the, the air that goes inside the building goes first underground, gets tempered, and then we are dealing with an air that is not 45 degrees or 50 degrees, but rather 26, 28 degrees, and then we still have five or six degrees to, to bridge the gap. And this reduces a lot the energy consumption. Now, the challenges here is the high water table, the aggressive environment, so we have to see how this under underground air grid can be conceived in a way so we don't have other problems like humidity, bacterial growth, etc. Johannes, um, talk to us a little bit about lighting design, thermal design. I mean, when we're looking at new buildings, you know, are people really taking this into consideration? And also, is, is this just almost like the secret of the, the architectural and the building industry? Or do the customers, do the consumers think about this? Do they know this? Are they looking for these features? when they go to actually buy and invest in buildings? It's a bit torn apart. There are, of course, uh, major companies which are directly asking for that. But most of the time you have to explain that. So that's also we have to get better in explaining comfort, which is a huge, tremendous, important um, role. Um, due to new di digital, uh, digitalization techniques like building information modeling and all these other cool simulation programs and techniques, it's possible to to get a grasp on comfort very early already. So, uh, to ex and then also therefore to explain it very early in the beginning, what kind of comfort um, do you get? And not just by numbers, because as engineers, we always want to give them a number in kilowatt hours or something. Um, but actually what we, what we try to do at Fraunhofer now is like to, to let them experience the room. So we, we put them in an actual room, which is more or less, which is what she's getting at the end gets augmented reality, but he's not getting just a visual interface, but we also put temperature levels on the surrounding walls, we put rafts, and so he can make his, his actual product decisions, like I want to have external shading, what does it do with my cooling ceiling, and this kind of reaction, he can just sit there and experience it by itself, so um, it's not all digital because we made an actual model of it, So, it, but it's a really a huge role to to help the, the later user or the, the buyer to really give them notion on comfort, explain it to him, let him experience it, that he makes good product decisions. Jared, um, you, it was very interesting, I think, there where you talked about uh, the utilities, should they be on-site or off-site. Um, and I think we've heard a lot here about people putting solar panels on their buildings, on their homes, and feeding back into the grid. I think there's tremendous excitement about that. but. You seem to advocate that actually maybe it's it's not always the way to go. Do we need a combination of both, or is there a purpose whereby 
you know, building should be combined with utilities or should they be separate? And just also, please, if anybody does want to ask our guests a question, please, please, just let me know. I think that um, it's a very interesting situation that what's happened is that as uh, renewable energy sources have developed and as systems have developed, um, architecturally, <coughs> uh, the architects, the engineers were challenged on a project by project basis and projects tended to be in the, in the infancy of the development of these systems, projects tended to be smaller. So they, be, they were single projects and people started using uh, PV and uh, thermal tubes and so on on their buildings as an example of how you could put renewables on and how you could then place it back in the grid. And all of that was very, very good. When you start to, I think what you then realize is as you start to get developments which are bigger and as people tackle bigger developments and as we know more about the performance of the uh, photovoltaics and so on, actually what you realize is that actually in this environment where you have a clear desert, uh, maximized sun, to actually go and put all your PVs all over your roofs and then try to clean and maintain them and service them becomes very difficult. So. You, you move to a position whereby building a big solar field and pumping the energy straight into the grid and then taking that back out into, into your buildings <coughs> is better than putting them on, on top of the buildings. But, but people I think are getting very excited about the concept of putting solar panels in their house and feeding and them. I, and I think it's absolutely still relevant to put, put solar <coughs> on buildings. But I think there's a, depending on the development, there's a choice to make. And, uh, and it's a choice of... How's the utility going to be run? How are you going to maintain the utility? And, uh, and what's the, the nature and location of the project that you're dealing with? Stuart, talk to me a little bit about natural ventilation. Um, you know, because this time of year, it's, it's just wonderful. It's, I still think some buildings inside don't understand that it's still cool outside right now, um, particularly in this area. And some of the shopping malls don't understand that it's a little cooler. So they actually don't have to maybe keep the temperature as high. But how important is it that we all be very aware? And again, let's, let's look at this region a bit too, because we do have the extremes of summer and winter here. <clears throat> yeah, and I think, you know, there's two aspects. There's, there's the education. So whether that's to the school children who then don't go running off home and turning on their air con because they get a little bit warm in their room uh, and they open a window instead or turn on a fan. Um, to inst more into institutional knowledge and, and trying to understand how you can create a, a proper working or learning environment inside a building that can at times switch its mode. Um, and it, it's almost analogous to the way that switching mode for transport is very difficult as well. You, 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 if a building works and a location where you're going to work works during one part of the year in a certain way, it's very difficult to switch to another way of getting there. So just like that, it's very difficult to suddenly switch and say, ah, this month we're not using that switch on the wall, we're going to open that window, we're going to do something else. So I think people are very much in the habit <coughs> uh, in all aspects of life. Building performance and control of buildings is very much one of those. There is also uh, worries that um, you know, it will increase the amount of dust inside, uh, the, the cleaning would have to change. Um, but, no, no you know, it's true, my housekeeper gives me a hard time. She's like, oh, you have the windows open and the door. It's like going to take me like so long and, now to clean the house. And, and I think here, you know, you do have to have the ability to, to change mode quickly uh, as conditions change. Um, but the, the, you know, the ability to be able to even just ventilate at night for two months of the year would have a massive impact on, on energy usage alone. And when we look at the energy efficiency here, I mean, even in terms of reducing the air conditioning, perhaps, and the temperature in some of the bigger buildings, I mean, I have heard that buildings could probably save up to 40% in terms of energy efficiency. It, it is staggering what you can do by just changing uh, the temperature that you run a building at. I mean, even down to a domestic level. I, I had over a barbecue with my neighbor with identical villas, identical sizes, identical size families. Uh, his bill was nearly twice mine, just due to a, a few degrees difference in the settings in the AC. Oh. Uh, and by living in a different way, by addressing your thermal comfort in other ways and not just AC, be that with choice of clothing or, or air movement. We have a question in the audience, so good, I'm absolutely thrilled. Um, oh no, we've got, just behind you. Yeah, there we go. 
Thank you. Let us know who you are and who you are. I'm Rula Sadik. Um, first of all, thank you very much. I'm finding the panel very, very interesting and um, coming from They're the me, best guys. We've got the, no, the experts I, here. Yeah. No, I, I mean that sincerely no, no, because what's happening a lot in these conferences is that you get repeat. But just to point, uh, to ask uh, for some feedback on a couple of things. I mean, I think we're in a region that is at the forefront of technology adoption and best practices. And I don't think that there might be, um, some of what you're saying is maybe um, uh, relevant that you know people are reluctant, they haven't had the conversations, but um, in my experience, whether it's the developers, the utilities, the contractors, everybody you know wants the wow factor, the next new thing, they want efficiency, they want to save. Three things that I find are impeding um, the, the adoption or maybe looking at it, and I just want your feedback, and I could be you know, wrong, but um, one is really in this region is this really, uh, w you know, where um, acceleration and on a speed that maybe is unheralded. You know, in Los Angeles, you can take a few years to review and get everybody on board and get your utilities, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with London, there's review process. But here, this kind of the speed, which is great, which has been great for the region, but maybe um, doesn't help when you need to review technologies and you need to integrate and you need to have more time to design because we're designing a lot of the time on the go, especially developers. So that's the time factor. The second one is the, the costs. Who bears the costs and who reaps the benefits? So some of the things that you're talking about is great, but actually the end user will reap a lot of the benefits through operating costs. And when you're making decisions, you're working on CAPEX. So I know in some industries we're trying to push the whole kind of TOTEX thing, try to compare the CAPEX and OPEX so that you really make a decision based <coughs> on that. But it really comes down to you know, the contractor, the developer, the end user, the government, and especially when you're talking about the city and the scale that I, I agree with you, it's, it's all about scale. So that's like sort of the economic balance. And then the third one, which I think is really key, is that the conversation is usually happening between, let's say, the developer and the designer. And we are, re you know, developers are really driven a lot by the regulation as well. And there's a huge gap between the utilities, the development, and so on. So I remember 10 years ago, and we won't mention any names, when we were trying to push a lot of this innovative stuff related to the building design, the urban design, etc., and so on, you couldn't because the utilities had different, and the transportation, you couldn't change the road widths, for example, to allow those cooling effects. You couldn't change some of the utilities. Um, and, you know, I, detail. So, uh, sorry I'm taking so long, but I actually think those are the key issues. If we could get everybody around the table, take the time to work it out between us, because there are lags. The utilities are innovative at one point, then the others, and so on. So, sorry for that. No, no, thank you so much. I mean, I think and you bring up very, very valid points there. And I think a few points you can all mm -hmm. contribute to, speed, cost, and, and again, who is having that conversation, who needs to have it? Stuart, yeah. you're ready to... I think, uh, um, just addressing the, the, the speed and potentially the cost thing in one, I want to throw something out there that a lot of the time when we work in the building industry as it is at the moment, you are building one project for one developer, there is no scale. It, what happened, and, and not often, for them to then run and be impacted by the total cost at the end, they're only looking at capital expenditure. Um, what would happen if, if we actually had companies or, or institutions that were able to do the development of the systems and the prefabrication without <coughs> specific projects in mind so that the products are there ready for when the demand is there. So you could still run a project quickly. And then when you look at the cost side of it, if the research and development, the fabrication cost, the erection cost and the running cost were all part of a uh, one package that a building owner instead of going and building his new headquarters and running it himself, would say, I would like to lease a headquarters for the next 25 years, and this system gets placed where they basically are leasing an entire building. And then it's up to the, the system suppliers to continually improve, to save money, and to make their business case work better. And it might be that elements of the building are swapped in and out as technologies move along. But it's, there's a, it is an economic driver to try and do that, and it's not just in the hands of one person who will only ever build one building uh, and potentially may not even uh, pay for the running of it. Gerard, you showed us an example there of a, a building almost like the concept of the chassis of the car. So you, you build that, and it's a, an easy model then to roll out. So even though maybe you only want one of them, because you've got so many, ordering one is going to be easy. Because you're building scale in one sense, 
but you can still sell me one if I want to put one in a field in the middle of nowhere. I think that that it was a very interesting project, and what was most interesting on that project for us was we built the building as an experiment, and we funded it and built it ourselves. What uh, what is interesting that having built it eight years ago, no other uh, buildings have been built of similar ilk here, and you say why? And the reason is that actually the biggest issue is that there is an upfront investment. And that you have to build, a, you have to create a factory, you have to create a production process in order to sell the product. And the difficulty is that, particularly in residential, it's, it's easier to follow the traditional route and just develop out your site than it is to actually set up a factory, create a product, and then develop 10 sites. And it's something that you need a bigger lead on as opposed to a single single developer. It needs a government lead. Hadi, talk to me a little bit about your new house that you're building, particularly in Mazda, the multi-comfort house. I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to just build one-off house and then we've all got to recreate a design or you have a long-term <coughs> thought in mind and plan? I'm coming to you in just a moment, sir. Yeah, in fact, this is not the first multi-comfort house built by Saint-Gobain, but it is the first in the Middle East region. It is the second in, uh, in uh, hot environments. Uh, it will be a place where we will showcase the latest technology in all our innovative products. It will be a training center. And of course, uh, the products that will be approved and used can be replicated. And the thing is, uh, it is always important to show the end product to the developers first to all the uh, stakeholders that have to do with this economic equation. So it's about capex, operating expenses, but also we should keep in mind there is a cost we don't take always into consideration, which is the cost of the environment. So what happens to those materials in 30, 40, 50 years? Are they recyclable? And what is the cost associated of bringing those materials to the construction site? So this is why it's a whole concept. In, in Abu Dhabi, we have two plants that are nearby, and we have made life cycle studies and carbon footprint studies that enable us to really deliver uh, really uh, low cost to the environment and also to the economy of, of such houses. Now, if a gentleman who wants to ask a question here, and bear in mind this is going to be the question that's going to wrap up the panel because I see panel number two has arrived. So, make it good. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, good morning, my name is Holger Herbst from Avances, and we produce Synfilm panels, the most beautiful one in, on Earth, uh, which the most power in. So I work since three years in this industry right now, and I like to ask the architects as well, because you lead the clients in the design, um, how you can push this kind of things more to integrate um, photovoltaics in the facades, especially here. So when we come to Europe, in Switzerland, Netherlands, Austria, Germany, we have really a great success, more and more projects. And the people have it in the mind and standard integration. Turkey, now same. We have three architects there in all famous projects they integrated. But here, where is the sun so much and where is the facade so big about the sky rapers? So there is it really, really less and slow going on. Super, and I think that's a lovely question to, to, to wrap it up and keep a, a final thought for me on all of this too, in terms of actually putting the photovoltaic and buildings and all of that. Um, so perhaps if you can all, I'll start with you, Hattie, maybe address that and then a, a closing thought in terms of the next step for the industry here. Uh, I think that uh, there is no single solution. I know that we all have the tendency to look at what we master best, but I think what to wrap up what Abu Dhabi and Master City are offering is a place where all those technologies have the chance to talk to each other, to interact. And this, I think, will be the future. We didn't cover much the topic of connecting objects, so being able to get sensors, know what's happening inside, interface with the inner building, find solutions that can enable us, as my colleague here said, to use more smartly uh, the, the environment, lower the energy bill, and give a better future to the future generations. 
thank you. Super. Um, and again, there's a lot we should we could discuss. This is uh, hopefully we'll have time to actually talk to the panelists afterwards and see some of the great thoughts. Stuart. Mm. Yeah, no, and just to address uh, this yeah. gentleman's direct question, I mean, we have done an, a couple of projects in the region where we've integrated photovoltaics into the facade of the building. Um, I think we get very little time with, uh, with sun at a low angle here, so generally the efficient places to put them are on roofs as opposed to vertical surfaces is what we find. Um, and then with the buildings being so dense and so tall, uh, we run out of space to get a decent area <coughs> relative to the volume in the building. Um, and then clients have been resistant. We've had a couple of projects where they've been on the drawings right up until the point at which uh, the client has to uh, sign a contract with the contractor and then they suddenly fall away. That's happened a number of times too. So, and again, just as a closing thought very quickly, what, what would make your life easier <laughs> when we look at uh, all the work that's going to air up? Um, I, I think it's just just uh, making sure that the thinking is together. So the thinking from the manufacturers of these new products, from from the architects, uh, from the, the institutes. I think as long as we're we're talking together at the right level uh, and pushing things forward and and challenging the people who ultimately fund these projects, then we should be able to move the industry forward. Johannes, and I, I, I am very aware you're. Uh, <laughs> it's, hopefully, it's it's not a building uh, infection that. Um, we picked up. It's that time of year in terms of the weather too. So we've all a bit of a cough. So get well soon. But uh, what the gentleman addresses here in terms of how the community, the building community, the architectural community, and again the living community, how can you bring all that together? And again, perhaps make these buildings more sustainable by by using what nature out there very much too. Yeah, for me, it's like it's also my my wrap up. By the way, um, I think for me, it's like it's a thinking beyond energy. I think it's like we have to broaden in terms of, uh, we have to take a life cycle perspective. Thank you, there's a, a whole system, like from life cycle assessment to life cycle costing to answer also the question before. That's just tools, it's not about the numbers, it's like about the communication, because it starts the communication and helps um, to overcome this kind of conflicts between user, tenants, owners, um, capex, opex, and so on. So it's like, it's like a talking way we have to communicate it, and I think we have to go beyond the, the usual perspective it's about energy, because energy, it's, it's not, our old, it's not the, the focus anymore. I think it's the life cycle perspective, it's resources, CO2 consumption, and it's, of course, it's comfort also, because in the end, it's about the guys living there and they're hopefully not dying uh, like me inside of a building. <laughs> hopefully you'll be, you'll be feeling a lot better, and I, I'm worried that uh, um, I'm picking up something. It's that time of year, isn't it? It's not buildings, it's, it's just, it's actually just, it is. It's getting through the day. Gerard, I'm going to let you close this off, give you the final word. You started off saying uh, we're not doing a great job here. Where's the hope for the future? It's there. I think that um, the simple answer is integrated design. And I think that, uh, you know, we've got to take a big lesson from our transport colleagues in that you know the car industry in particular has uh, found a process of a fully integrated design the vehicles we're getting a, have bigger and better systems uh, integrated into them all of the market profiling all of the economics are all being studied at the same time as the product is being produced and uh, it's a case of bringing the construction industry the research and development and the uh, architectural and engineering disciplines together and uh, integrating the process. And, and that will then begin to affect the market. And the developers are an essential part of that. And indeed, how often have we heard that? It really is about that joined up thinking. I think that you, you bring everybody to the table and you really, um, and ultimately then you should get a wonderful product and we should all live happier lives and more comfortable lives because that's actually what it's all about. We all need a home, we need somewhere to live, and we all need buildings to work in, and um, we need buildings to, to function. So, well, thank you for some inspiring thoughts there also, I think, and uh, you know, hopefully by the time we maybe meet next year, we might have some new developments. Hadi's house will be ready in Mazdar City, we can all go see that. <laughs> and indeed, I mean, to, to go see Mazdar, the development is incredible out there. Uh, I was just recently there, it's, it's Crane City. I mean, it's, it's, it's tremendous to see what's going on. It might be a bit disruptive at the moment, but um, it's, you know, phase one is almost done and some of the phases running together, many of them have started. So it'll be a fabulous project, I know, when it's finished and even what's there. Um, and again, 
festival time for the next two days at Mazdar. So you can all, if you haven't been, go out and see it and have a look and see what that project does. I want to thank all of you. Thank you so much for taking the time. I wish we had more time to continue this conversation. It's the nature of conferences, but I see uh, team two of the morning ready to go. So once again, thank you all so much. And thank you, dear audience. Thank you so much. <laughs>